Well, what I want to talk to you about now is a filter which I received from a lady um, who lives in the Tokyo Tower. This is it. It came in an envelope. Yeah, that's the envelope. Um, not in the Tokyo Tower. Who lives near the Tokyo Tower? About 300 meters, she says, from the Tokyo Tower, on the 20th floor, in, in an apartment on the 20th floor of a building. And she got in touch with me. Lots of people from Japan get in touch with me to ask my advice about whether they should evacuate, whether they should leave the country. And I usually say yes, incidentally, especially if they've got small children. Certainly get far away as they can uh, from, from the contamination. Now the, question, the question that she asked me was, should she get away because she was living in Tokyo? Was it very serious in Tokyo? So I said, well, send me um, an air conditioning filter, because she lived in this apartment high up, 20 stories up. Um, in the centre of Tokyo, and I thought probably it would be all right, but the way to tell would be to look at an air conditioning filter if she had an air conditioning unit. A lot of people do. So she sent me this air conditioning filter, and here it is. Here's the air conditioning filter. See? Um, it has a certain amount of dust in it, which I can show you. You see that there's... see the dust in there? There we are. Um, and so I, I didn't really expect to find anything in an air conditioning filter, particularly one like this one, which was just inside the flat. So in fact it wasn't outside, it didn't take air from the outside, all it did was circulate the air inside and keep it cool or warm, depending on what they wanted. So it continuously circulated the air inside the apartment. And she told me that she'd left, uh, she, that she'd switched this thing off and evacuated Tokyo for several months after the accident, so she went a far way away, so this filter was just sitting inside the apartment, and then she switched it on when she came back, which was uh, several months after the accident. And so I really never expected to find anything, but I thought we'd better have a look and see. So off, uh, along it came, and um, <coughs> there's a certain amount of dust in it, but not very much. You can measure, you can, me you can wait, I can scrape it off and, and, and measure the dust. Um, but but, but uh, what I... What I was mostly interested in, first of all, was to use a... Um, see, we have a number of instruments here, but the first one to look at it with was a Geiger counter. So I looked through the, I looked through the package with a Geiger counter. It didn't look too bad. It didn't really look much above background. Uh, and we have some quite big, sophisticated um, gamma spectrometry equipment here. This is a, this is a large uh, cesium iodide crystal. You put the sample in the hole, it's called a well detector, and then you measure the gamma radiation in, the, in there. But in this case, what I decided to do was, because there was not much dust, I decided to use um, a beta scintillating counter, one that also detects alpha emitters. That's this, this device here, I've got it switched on at the moment, and it's, it's measuring um, just the background here. You can see the background here varies slightly but it's about three, it's about three counts per second if you integrate it it's about three counts per second we've got 2.81 there now but it goes up and down um, and you can integrate it over a long time period and we get th uh, we get um, three counts per second and the detector head um, which I can show you here is where is it now? There, you can see it. You see that? That's the, that's the detector head. It's at the moment it's looking at a piece of paper, and so we're going to put this machine. We're going to put this um, filter on onto the piece of paper and see what we find. So I'm going to do that now, and I have to be rather careful here because this dust might well be radioactive. And in fact, actually, since I've done this already, I can tell you that it is. I mean, actually, what I'm doing here is, is rather dangerous. But in fact, although it's dangerous, it's, you have to recognise that a lot of people are going to be working with filters and, and, and technicians are going to be working with filters in Tokyo. And they're not at all going to realise that these filters are extremely dangerous materials. Now, let's see what we've got here. Yes, you see? Now the, 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 um, the count rate from this filter has gone right up. It's gone up to five, six, seven counts per second. Here we are. The 
listen to that. It's got nine, ten counts per second here doing us. five counts per second there. I'm not going to leave it out anymore because I'm a bit nervous about this whole thing and I should really be wearing a mask and and, uh, and all the rest of the gear. But let's live dangerously occasionally. Anyway, the point is that this, the amount of material on this filter which created that increase in radioactivity not good. It's uh, very little. It's a, it, I, I, I scraped some of it off and weighed it, and I found that it was about a tenth of a gram, maybe, on the on the on the bit that's uh, that's underneath the, the scanner here. So one tenth of a gram of this dust is giving a, is doubling the background radiation to the probe. Well, more than doubling it, really. Well, yeah, about doubling it. So you're talking about something that's seriously radioactive. Anyway, I put this inside the gamma spectrometer in this contraption, and I found that the uh, the, the uh, concentration of cesium-137 in there was enormously high, higher than I've seen anywhere else, certainly higher than any of the vehicle filters. So we have a serious problem in Tokyo, and I think that's really what I wanted to say. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of becquerels per kilogram in this dust. And this is dust that was recirculated from inside somebody's apartment on the 20th floor of a building which was, between three, which was about 300 metres from the Tokyo Tower. Right? I think this is quite, quite a serious discovery. I think um, that at minimum what should be done here is that people who are servicing these filters should be uh, told that they represent a serious hazard for inhalation of the dust. And in fact, in the United Kingdom, they would, be, uh, they would have to be licensed. So people who were working on these car filters or uh, filters for um, uh, air conditioning units or any other filters uh, would have to be licensed under the Radioactive Substances Act. Uh, and they would have to have dosimeters, and they would have to be, uh, their urine would have to be tested, and all sorts of things would have to happen to them, because there are laws in Europe that prevent people from working with radioactive material, material as radioactive as this. Um, so something should be done about it, and that's why I'm making this uh, this short video. That the, this material will be is being sent at the moment uh, to the to another laboratory for testing for. Um, for more accurate testing as to how much radioactivity is there and what other isotopes are there which can't be detected by this equipment here, which is rather, well, it's very good. It, it doesn't very have very high resolution, so it's not able to see the, 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 the minor constituents or, or, the, or some of the constituents that only have weak gamma signals, like, for example, lead-210. Uh, I found lead-210, which is a very serious radionuclide. Uh, uh, lead is, has a low boiling point, and it's very likely to be in the general mix of stuff that came from Fukushima. Uh, and it has a daughter nuclide, which is polonium-210. And polonium-210 is the stuff that killed uh, Litvinenko. So we have some serious stuff floating around Japan. Anyway, thank you very much for listening to me, and I'll talk to you again. This is the um, gamma spectrum of the sample that we scraped from the uh, filter. And uh, we can now ask the program to analyze these peaks that you see. Um, and I'll just do that. Ask for a full analysis. And you see that the, the program is running, running across the peaks here. And each one of these peaks comes out at a particular position in terms of its energy. And then we'll get an analysis. Now here's the spectrum analysis that tells us what's in the in the sample and we can see immediately that the sample contains cesium-134 and here we have 42,000 42,000 becquerels per kilogram and cesium-137 we have um, 
68,000 becquerels per kilogram. And also, interestingly, you see here we have a lot of lead-210. Now, lead-210 is a very interesting radionuclide. It's normally natural uh, decay product of radium-226, but here we've got far too much of it. We've got 7,500 here, 7,500 becquerels per kilogram of lead-210. And that's almost certainly from the reactor because there's no bismuth-214 there, which is what we would expect if it was natural. And also there's thorium-234. Now look at that, that's the daughter of uranium-238. So that's giving us 3,000 becquerels per kilogram of uranium-238. And there's also uranium-235. We've got 240 becquerels per kilogram of uranium-235. So far too much. Now we're going to ask this to put in the the nuclides. So we'll do that. Here we are, nuclides, and it says show nuclides. Okay. So we can ask it to do that. Now we can go to any point here and look at the spectrum to see what there is. And here's the thorium 234, you see. Now that, and there's the lead 210. Let me let me take you a bit closer to this. And you can see how clever this stuff is. See this? So there's quite clearly lead-210, thorium-234. These are very, very small samples. There's, there's thorium-234 again. Let's move across here and see what we've got. We'll go up here at this. And there's uranium-235 here. See that? Now uranium-235, that's that peak there, is telling us that we've got a lot of uranium-235. That means, with the other thing, we've got... Um, We've got clearly, now there's some cesium-134. Now these are the big peaks of cesium here. Here's the big cesium-134 peak. Where is it? There. There it is. Look at that. See? So that's a big cesium-134 peak there. And remember this sample is the sample that I scraped off that filter that I showed you. There's cesium-137. There we are. Cesium-137. So this technique enables us to tell exactly what it is in the sample. Very clever stuff, really. Although it does cost a bit of money, because we have to. I haven't got a machine like this. Cesium-134. And of course there are various other uh, substances there, including natural substances. So we will have um, potassium-40 at 1460. Let's see if we can find that for you. There it is, potassium-40. So we know it's potassium-40 because we know where the peak is. It's at 1460. So what we can say about this sample is that what we said before is true, that the sample is extremely radioactive, the, uh, the, the filter is extremely radioactive, and it contains high levels of uranium and lead-210 and cesium-137, all substances which are inside an apartment on the 20th floor of a block 300 meters from the Tokyo Tower. Isn't that quite something? It's quite something. Rhodium-102 we have here. This is a fission product from uh, Fukushima. But my, the most serious one, the one I has the U-235. I mean, these peaks are not very large, but then remember the sample is really small. Really small sample. It's just a few few grams. Chlorium-234. So that's our 